Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Unsure sometimes why reality is intertwined? Your life somehow keeps crossing the dream of mine. Moments of coincidence one can only try to deny. The grander scheme of creation starting to come to life. Elohim ancestors, seduction in Eden. Stories of lost paradise, banishment from the kingdom. Something doesn't connect at all, the rise and fall of man. And how it all began. Somehow we got lost in separation. And are reaching back now in desperation. To what eludes us, even now. Beneath it all one story. God, angels, heavenly glory. The myth of how it all began. The birth of man, Eve and Adam. The consequence of events that all seem random. Another reminder, this moment with you. This journey we voyaged through. Passing the trial of life again. Having grasped the long-hidden secret of dreams, I've tapped into the mind of he that created the everything, and now things will never be the same. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and we will be streaming here I'm in near Athens, Georgia, and I'll be joining you for the next two hours. And we'll be covering some very interesting topics. Um, the focus will be on the giants, lost cities, ancient technologies. And I'm going to tie together some, well, some old news stories as well as some new accounts uh, on things that have happened in our ancient past that are connected to the the fallen ones as the fallen angels or what um, well most people think the Nephilim as being the children of the <clears throat> fallen angels but it's my opinion that the Nephilim are the fallen angels themselves um, the rebel angels that were cast out of the heavens a long time ago, and that the giants, the hybrid ones, they are the result, the consequence of the interdiction between the um, the sons of God with the daughters of humanity. And specifically in the Kebra Nagas, it speaks of the daughters of Cain, and, and I do believe that... Um, that the daughters of Cain were the ones that had seduced and lured the watchers to join him. And also the rebel angels, um, cause they are both involved. And if you don't know the difference, the rebel angels were the ones that were cast out of the heavens. Uh, welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, those that I can see, Mr. Rowe and Jer, Zippy, Noodles, um, we've got Monkey and Wild Bob and Dharma and um, Olive and Cortec and a bunch of others, I'm sure, 
Zach, and and all the others that are in the chat room that aren't in, not in the initial scroll. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. And as I said, I, I do have some interesting information, but as to the, the differences between the rebel angels and the fallen angels, the rebel angels were the one-third of the angels of the Most High that joined Lucifer, that were tempted and joined Lucifer in rebellion and that were cast out of the heavens after the separation of light and darkness and the division of the forces of the Most High, the um, celestial hierarchy into the forces of light and dark, good and evil. And that that war, welcome Lou and Grog and Casey and all the others um, that are just now joining us. But anyways, um, and so they were the ones that were cast out initially, that were here even before humanity, modern humanity, was created. And that the fallen angels, if you want to call them the Anunnaki, the Nephilim, um, whatever you want to refer to the rebel angels as, uh, they were the ones that were cast out a long time ago that had established and were creating megalithic structures and cities um, according to astroarchaeology alignments to certain constellations, uh, predominantly to Orion, the belt of Orion, the three stars of Orion, which are said to be a womb of, still a womb of, massive, uh, the birth of many stars and a hotbed of a lot of young stars and that for some reason this particular area of the sky is uh, demarcated by the rebel angels, the fallen ones, as being their place of origin and that there's mention of this in the book of Job where uh, the Most High speaks about the Pleiades and the belt of Orion, and there's another mention of another star constellation, but I can't pull it off right now um, off the top of my memory. But anyways, and the Watchers are the ones that are mentioned in the Book of Enoch, the 200 Watchers led by Semyaza, and that... Um, they were the ones that lusted after the daughters of Cain, after the daughters of humanity that left their place of habitation, abandoned their first estate um, because they wanted to mate and to mingle and to interject themselves into the affairs of modern humanity. And there were 200 of them uh, led by a lot of different archangels and that they, because they did leave their place of habitation uh, and because they challenged Christ to allow them to come here, they, they had initially said that they were going to come here and teach about the heavens, not the, um, the hidden and the, the mysteries of the heavens, but to teach about the Morning Star administration, about the Most High God, and the Son, uh, Christ, Savior, Messiah, and that they were going to teach about the Word of God. Um, but they did that only so that they could actually come here and that they were tempted and lusted after uh, the Daughters of Humanity and they made a pact upon... Um, receiving bodies of flesh they were put into male bodies uh, they were transformed into flesh much like Adam and Eve were when they were cast out kicked out and exiled from par paradise and that once they were banished here to this world to this fallen realm they were then placed into bodies of flesh and so the spirit was joined with the dust and the you know, where it describes in Genesis that 
uh, Adam was created of the dust that was his body, um, his flesh body, because our bodies are made of the dust of the ground, and after we die, they return to the dust, but that the spirit that was blown into the flesh form, into the body, that was the the angelic being, our spiritual being. What I had talked about in uh, the poem that I just read about our past life. Now, when I speak about our past life, I'm not talking about our reincarnating over time and throughout history into multiple bodies or different forms, but that I was speaking about our spiritual incarnations as sons of God and that we were once part of the celestial hierarchy, uh, that our spiritual being, that we were part of and even witness to what is cited as the rebellion, the temptation, and the later war in heaven. And that that has really part to play our, um, the, our interaction with that whole battle the things that we did and the decisions that we made, that that has a lot to do with uh, a lot of our incarnating into the flesh now. And that really the original sin ties to that, uh, the war in heaven, more so than Eve eating a fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That our... Being in flesh form now is a result of our decisions when we were uh, in our uh, spiritual being and not because, you know, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and were then exiled from paradise and found themselves here, uh, but that we had part to play in our being incarnated in the flesh now. And so, anyways... So that will set kind of the foundation, the premise for some of the information we're going to be going into uh, tonight. Also, I wanted to make mention uh, to the many people that tried to call me at the end of last week's show uh, for me to take phone calls um, that I was not able to do so because I did not have hold of the server but that uh, one of my producers had hold of the server, and so if I would have answered you, I would have dropped the call. And so this tonight, um, they did get the phone lines fixed for me. Uh, it was you know, just some technical difficulties, um, but now I am added to all that, and so we should be able to take uh, phone calls. And so after the first segment here, the first 30 minutes, just allow me to set the foundation for the rest of the show and also to share a few current events, stories, and news items with you. And then uh, should you want to call in to share a commentary or to ask a question, uh, anything of that nature, then certainly do so. But, um, but like I said, just give me a little time to set the foundation for what we are going to be going into this evening. And I do have a number of news items. Um, some I've, a couple I've maybe mentioned in previous shows, but I haven't tied it together with some of the stuff I'm going to be presenting to you this evening. And so I think it will be good to have it all together in one place. And so that when I publish the archives that, um, you will, you will be those that listen to the fullness of this show. Uh, all of these disjointed news articles and current events that I've read in the past uh, will be all put together and that they will all relate and it will make for a, a, a really interesting evening and topic of discussion for tonight. And so... The first item that I wanted to share is a it's a it's basically an old story, but it's from I just heard about it. It's a news article that was put out 
about a city that was found um, buried under Missouri. And we find this kind of thing happening often that when um, when people, when, you know, they're excavating, they're trying to dig a well or dig into a certain part of the city, even like what we talked about last week with the individual that had done, was utilizing ground penetrating radar and discovered all these catacombs and also was able to see um, artifacts of gold, tablets, things of that nature, and that the, the mythologies uh, for the native peoples in that particular area spoke of a race of um, lizard people or reptilian beings that lived and that had taken um, refuge in the deep underground uh, in a city that was built under Los Angeles at this particular time and that when they were excavating and digging for roads and um, they had discovered these catacombs and this kind of thing uh, I had read an article not uh, maybe a couple months back here. I shared it on Revolution Radio, talking about some excavations in a similar way. They were uh, building a street, a street tunnel in Egypt, and that they also dug into what seemed to be an already inhabited portion of some subterranean facility. And they made mention of these particular lizard people or some kind of like the Nagas of the Hindu mythology. Uh, but that this particular topic, the city that I'm going to be speaking about this evening is actually um, is in connection with a giant. Um, a giant three times the size of modern humanity. So you would say like 18 feet tall, 18 plus feet tall. And if you don't believe that there were ever individuals of such monstrosity, um, such awesome size, well, even in, there was a book that was recently published like maybe a year or two years ago called um, Ancient Giants in the Americas. And the individual that compiled this particular book he shared, much like the article that I'm about to share, um, but he did a, a search in many of the different libraries and different local area libraries all across America where he was keyword searching giants, uh, cyclops, you know, all these different keywords associated to giants or men of renown or men of large stature, uh, anything of that nature, to find news articles from the early uh, and uh, mid and late 1800s, early 1900s, that talked about the discovery of these kind of same kind of thing, these skeletons. And, uh, and there was a lot, especially in this country, in the United States, uh, in, in connection with the mound structures that were found everywhere across the United States and that you can still find large uh, mound structures that have been preserved in either state or national parks and that they are still in existence uh, to this day, but that in the early um early time of the pioneers and the early explorers as far, as far as the white settlers that arrived here in the Americas with the pilgrims and the history of the colonization of America, um, you find a lot of these stories talking about these mound structures and how farmers or ranchers or individuals that were trying to to use the stone from these structures to build up infrastructure for their house or for roads or whatever, that in removing and excavating these sites, 
they would find these huge bodies. And there's mention of skeletons multiple times in this particular book from these news articles, um, again, going back in the early history of America as far as the history of, you know, um, colonized America, but that even the Native Americans spoke of a race of giants, a race of red-haired cannibal giants that lived here on, that were here even before they were, and that they lived side by side with these individuals, and that they went to war with them because they were cannibals, and they would abduct their children or members of their tribe, and that they would eat them, either sometimes alive, where they would bound them, and then they would cut pieces of these individuals while they were still alive from them, and either cannibalize it raw or cook it over a fire, and basically the, the individual would have to watch themselves being eaten by these giants until they, you know, died or passed away, and... um and that, you know, I've shared and done many shows here on this network talking about these red hair cannibal giants. And you can find them in the archive of uh, the YouTube channel that I publish um, under Endeavor Freedom. Uh, specifically, you can look up giants, keyword search it, and Endeavor Freedom or red hair giants, and you'll find all the you know, the many shows that I've done on this particular topic. There's even a playlist that has like 20 or 30 different shows on this particular topic there at um, Endeavor Freedom, E-N-D-E-A-V-O-R, Freedom on YouTube. Uh, but anyways, let me go ahead and read this sh this story before we get to break. And then we'll pick it up on the other side. Uh, but it says this, Missouri's Buried City. A strange story comes up from Missouri. At Moberly in the state, some workmen at the bottom of a coal shaft, 360 feet below the surface, came upon a buried city arched in by a hard and thick stratum of lava. The streets are regularly laid out and enclosed by walls of stone, which is cut and dressed in a fairly good, although rude, style of masonry. A hall 30 by 100 feet was discovered wherein were stone benches and tools of all description um, for mechanical service. Further search disclosed statues and images made of composition closely resembling broads but lacking luster. Of course, curiosity was aroused to ascertain what kind of people dwelt in the strange city buried for centuries beneath their surface with a good deal of difficulty in removing debris. The workmen finally succeeded in reaching a spot where a stone fountain was found in a wide court or a street, and from it a stream of perfectly pure water was flowing, which upon being tested was found to be strongly impregnated with lime. Lying beside the fountain were portions of the skeleton of a, uh, of a human being, and from measurement of the bones it was concluded that when alive, the figure was three times the size of an ordinary man and possessed of a wonderful muscular power and quickness. The implements found in the city embrace bronze and flint knives, stone and granite hammers, a metallic saws of rude workmanship, but proven metal, and others of similar character. They are not so highly polished nor so accurately made as those now finished by our best mechanics, but they show skill and an evidence of 
advanced civilization. The searching party spent 12 hours in the depths and only gave up exploration because of the oil in their lamps being low. These facts are vouched for by the recorder of the city of Moberly and the city marshal who were of the exploring party. The story, if true, is singular, and if not, is a yarn that would have done credit to Missouri in the palmiest days of their romancing. All right, I'm going to see if I can find the link to this, and I'll share it with you. Uh, but this was a, an article that just recently was came out on beforeitsnews.com, and, and the actual article was dated to 1885. And if you want to read some of the particulars of it, I will post it in the chat room. It's definitely interesting, and this will be an easy way for you to share it with your friends or loved ones, family members, whatever. Um, I found it fascinating, and I also posted it to our website at fallenangels.tv uh, for those that might be interested in looking into it as well. And we're almost to break. Welcome, Doc Who and Bella and Briar and Hal. Um, and then I'll read some other stories that are similar and that are connected to you know, discoveries, which just shows, you know, speaks about um, how long ago. I mean, think of a city that was buried 360 feet down and how long ago it had to have been that that city was actually, you know, topside. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, all right, and so I wanted to just pick up on some of what we were talking about. Yeah, hey, brother, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, um, can't hear you too clear. Not you, Jer, somebody had just called in. And so I just add them to the conference call. Can Caller, you, what's your name and where are you from? What's your name? Yeah, uh, they just hung up. Uh, it's all right. Um, so we're all good. The, the the phones are working for you, huh? Yeah, I think so. Um, all right. I'll let you rock and roll, and uh, I'll be on standby with you, okay? Okay, brother. I appreciate it. Much love. Okay, and um, so... I think we do have the situation resolved as far as the call-in numbers. So if you did want to call in to make a comment or to ask something about the uh, the show and the topic of discussion, you can do so at 310-421-4053. And hopefully if everything's been resolved, I'll be able to... Um, to tie you in and bring you on to the server. And so I appreciate those of you that, that do. And I know a lot of you um, are hesitant to do so because you uh, are, you know, afraid to be on radio or whatever. But um, I, I think that you're all very wise and very, very well researched and that you should trust yourself to be well-spoken and that the, the words will flow, and being on the radio is no no big deal. It's just like having a conversation with your friends and family members on your cell phones, which I know a lot of people do a lot of that. So, anyways, um, continuing with what we were talking about, the article that I read right before we went to break truly is an interesting article in that it gives you insight into some of the structures, the ancient structures that are found um, and that have been covered over and whether a lot of these megalithic sites and megalithic structures and 
ancient cities were covered with the deluge of Noah's day or even to the deluge that occurred that drowned Atlantis, that there's, um, there's accounts in the mythology of the giants that were here previously and that were warring uh, that had tried to make a slave race of uh, the pre-Adamic beings that were here and even the rebel angels that the Most High judged them with sending fire down from the heavens in the form of comets or asteroids and, and that there are craters all over the world that give an account to um, the earth having been, bar been bombarded in such way. And that we had a, an event happen over Siberia, not, it was during our lifetimes that devastated the landscape. And it's only because um, the, it's mostly desolate and there's not a lot of people in, in, uh, living there as, as far as humanity or city structures or, you know, huge places of residence that a lot of people weren't killed and weren't devastated by that particular event. Um, and there's speculation. Some say that it was some kind of UFO phenomena or some kind of comet from the sky. We don't know, but it was definitely a devastating event, and it leveled like miles and miles of forest, of structures, tree structures. Um, now, it didn't create like a large crater type structure like those that are found that pockmark the moon or like the um, the huge crater structures in Arizona and other parts of the world. And we can only imagine what kind of impact, you know, created those kind of devastating, huge, deep crevasses and um massive structures on the face of the earth and that they had to have had a devastating impact. But anyways, uh, the next article that I want to share is along those lines. It, it talks about a, um, well, in the mythology of the natives, it speaks about that they were, judged in that way and it talks about the lost city of the giants and how these particular beings they became lost to um to to history because of such devastation that happened uh an extremely long time ago and so i'm going to read that article and i'll share a link to it as well in the chat room for those that want to follow along. And that this will also lead me to another couple. The The one that I share after this is truly astounding um, because it talks of high technology too. Like a lot of these structures that we're talking about now and that are found, uh, they make mention of stone tools or even with like metal saws and stuff like that. Uh, that you know, is truly fascinating. But in the article that I share after this one, we're going to be talking about really deep technology like holographic projection, uh, a library of what, you know, had happened on the earth going all the way back, uh, those kind of things. And you'll find that to be truly fascinating. But I want to read this one first because it talks about the the impact um, and so let me read this it says this the article is entitled lost city of giants could be hidden in the jungle can these extremely large ancient tools shed more light on the mystery 
There are thousands of ancient myths and legends from all corners of the world telling of giant beings that once in the distant past inhabited the earth. These beings were just as horrifying as they were powerful. It was believed that although these mighty men were that, uh, and although they were wiped out, they will one day return and rule this planet. Now, I want to make a commentary on this particular passage. The mention of the return of the fallen angels and the return of the giants is also cited in some of the apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books as well as the canonical text of the Bible. Now, the specific passages that I'm referencing and that I've shared here many times on this particular show, uh, there's one passage in the Cave of Treasures that talks about Alexander having prayed to the Most High God to give him the power to, um, to trap the giants that he was then fighting against and that he was able to corner them and that they went into a hole um, a passage that led into the interior of the earth and that when when Alexander prayed the these two mountains moved and came together and trapped these particular 33 tribes interesting number too huh? um, these 33 tribes of giants in and two of them were named Gog and Magog and we know about the um, the association as far as the the in in Grit, Great Britain in the UK how they have the festival of the two giants Gog and Magog but anyways that they were these two tribes along with these others were captive were held captive in the interior in the hollow aspect of the earth and that they would un, not until the end of days be released and that they would be part of the punishment of the wrath of God being poured out upon those that are not written into the books of life. And that, um, and it mentions this also in Joel chapter two with the release of the, um, you know, of these particular beings and also the locust army in Revelation chapter 9, uh, it makes mention of this. In in Second Ezra, it speaks about the return of the dragons of Arabia, which is an interesting allusion as well. And you can find that in Second Ezra chapter 15. Um, but anyway, so there's several passages, the mention of the flying fiery si uh, serpents, the cockatrice, um, and, and that you'll find the connections between the, the Nakash or the feathered serpent and that of their children, which are the men of renown, the giants, the hybrid giants that we're speaking of now. And that the giants are, you know, again, after the, 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 watchers having left their place of habitation, having left their first estate, and that they came after the second incursion of angels during the time of Yared, as is spoken of in the book of Enoch. And that before then, the megalithic structures and the cities that we find having been created and that are very ancient, that these particular cities were formed and were created by the rebel angels, the Anunnaki or the Nephilim, as you, as we would call them, and that they were also giants as well. And, and so um, two sets of giants, two sets of fallen watcher angels as well. All right, continuing. Um a number of ancient human bones prove that humans much taller than the modern man once inhabited the world. We should also not forget that there are still many ancient mysteries hidden in unexplored parts of our jungles. 
Last year, author and researcher Bruce Fenton discovered a previously unknown ancient pyramid structure in a remote region of the Ecuadorian jungle. Now, Fenton and his team have conducted more investigation and completed an analysis of the incredible finding. It would appear that the pyramid structure is a small part of something much larger. Based on the results of his research, Fenton thinks that the complex may be the lost city of the giants. At the discovered site, there is one extremely large pyramidical type structure of approximately 80 meters square base and 80 meters height with steep inclined walls. This structure is made up of irregular shaped large cut stone blocks. Each is currently calculated to be approximately two ton in weight. Many hundreds of such blocks make up the walls of the building uh, Fenton writes in one of his reports on this area. During his investigation, soil was cleared from the side of a large hill to reveal cut and dressed stone blocks. These stones are quite smooth surface and they barely aged thanks to the protective layer of earth. Between the blocks there appears to be a hard bonding substance like cement or more actually like concrete. Fenton says that there are reasons to consider the building to be man-made and if they are then this ancient site is in fact much older than others already known about in Ecuador. Quote, Just how long ago the structure was built and how many centuries passed before it was abandoned and then eventually swallowed completely by the local environment, this all remains a mystery. Some evidence is emerging from the site that can help us theorize on timing. The different look of the hidden blocks and those exposed are one of the first clues it takes to really weather a stone to have it eaten away by acidity or rain, for example. There is a stark difference between the newly uncovered stonework and that of the already exposed wall. The working hypothesis at present is that either an earthquake or tropical rainstorm induced a landslide and caused the soil and plants of one wall to come sliding down. I'm going to skip just a little bit and talk. get to the, the mythology. All right, just to mention some tools that were from. Scattered around the area are a great many artifacts of stone and of pottery. Many of these objects appear to be stone tools that could have been used either in mining or refining some kind of metal ore. Uh, which is uh, one of the interesting facts of a lot of the megalithic cities that if you look back in the ancient past, especially those uh, that were uh, established by the Anunnaki as cited in the Sumerian text, is that their focus was on gathering the gold ore here. And the reason so is because of the uh, speculation that the Anunnaki on their own planet, on planet X or Nibiru, um, which according to some is now visible in our southern skies, and that in seeing it, you also see it with many moons around it, which is Interesting, but anyways, um, that because they were undergoing ecological disaster, the scientists upon their planet had deduced that in order to sway off devastation from the impact of the sun's rays upon their atmosphere every time they came close to the sun in their orbital proximity, that they would have to crush up the gold, which was not plentiful, on their planet and into a powder form and suspend it into the atmosphere. And that in so doing, they were able to create a refraction field to kind of divert 
and to reflect away from the planet the harmful rays, especially those of the X-ray and gamma ray wavelength. And so uh, it, it created a layer of protection that, um, that did help them to stave off devastation uh, to their to the um, to the planet and to the creatures and to the beings living there is what the texts say amongst these tools are some that would be extremely difficult for a normal sized human being to use in any practical fashion this has led to a strong suspicion that this is one of the legendary Lost City of the Giants, well known in the local Ecuadorian legends about the Amazonian area. Such places generate great fear among the members of today's jungle tribes, as they are believed to be protected either by spirit guardians or beings not of this world. There's a, if you look up the article, there's an image that shows one of these stone hammers, and it is I mean, the guy can barely even hold it up with both of his hands. It's just huge. All right, continuing. These huge hammers are, in Fenton's opinions, one of the best proof that this area could be the lost city of the giants. Quote, What really strongly points towards this habitation having housed the same race of giants is the presence of extremely oversized hammers or at least the stone hammerheads, assuming these were attached to hardwood handles, they would be of both incredible size and weight, making their use as tools impractical for a typical Inca or indigenous Indian, these being generally slight-built people of around five foot or so. Who on earth would make a hammer like this as a, as a real tool? Remember also that any work would be done in the incredible heat and humidity of the Amazon jungle. How long could anyone swing such a thing before collapsing from heat exhaustion? We'll be right back. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and we've been speaking about Giants, the lost cities, and their technologies. Um, I, I do want to, you know, again, just take a quick moment to remind everybody that we here at Revolution Radio, we donate our time in order to bring truth to you in a way that is not widely available in many radio networks or any other platforms in the way that they are uh, that you can find here upon the planet and with the many hosts uh, and 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 so anytime that you can support us monetarily even if it's just a little bit please do so because it goes a long ways in keeping us on the air and being able to do the things that we do and the coming to you and the ways that we come to you and that there's a huge eclectic array uh, a motley crew of very varied opinions and perspectives from all walks of life that are hosting different shows uh, seven days a week all hours of night and day and that we talk about and have informed opinions on many things that are little understood and little spoken about in, as far as specifically um, and especially mainstream media outlets and also other alternative news sites that I don't know of another radio network that has the many voices that we do covering the news and the way that we cover it. And so those of you that can afford to do so, please support us um, in whatever way you can. And, and I think one of the better ways is to just simply subscribe to the monthly archives, $4.95 a month, and to 
gain access to and download all of the MP3s from all of the various hosts going all the way back a year. I mean, it's just um, it's a tr tremendous bargain, to say the least. And it would also give you the ability to listen to some others that you may not have had time and, and or a chance, opportunity to catch live. Um, you can download, you know, some shows from them and put them on your MP3 and or burn them to uh, audio CD and listen to them as you drive or jog or, you know, whatever it is that you are doing. Um, and that would be a good way to to make yourself informed even that much more. All right, I'm going to finish this particular article, but I. I do want to say this that um, I was wrong. This is not the article that speaks about the judgment having come from the skies, and so uh, I I'm going to get into that article next, and then the one afterwards will go into that makes mention of the high technology, and it's a fascinating news story, and I should have time to cover these two news items in full all right and so back to that article and i did post the link in the chat room and i will do so again after i finish reading it talking about the these stone tools that were found in the ecuadorian jungle uh, and that the indigenous peoples the native tribes there cite as being the lost city of the giants um, Fenton continues with this. Who on earth would make a hammer like this as a real tool? Remember also that any work would be done in the incredible heat and humidity of the Amazon jungle. How long could anyone swing such a thing before collapsing from heat exhaustion? I have been unable to match this object to anything known in Inca archaeology. And in fact, there is simply nothing like it in the Ecuadorian Museum of Cultural History located in Quito that would suggest any of the known civilizations of this region, Fenton says. Also, quote, many explorers have gone into the jungles around this area and failed to return. It is certainly known to be dangerous and to enter for the full-hearted hardy traveler even the most expert explorers have vanished without trace in the hunt for lost cities and the supposed existence of immense treasure to be found. Now, Fenton and his team would like to explore further and they need to safely travel to the site and record the exact position located in an inhospitable and notoriously dangerous part of the Amazonian jungle. Quote, and this will end this article. We need to raise enough funds to organize and document an expedition into the Ecuadorian Amazonian jungle that will return to a recently discovered ancient pyramid complex. This site is suspected to be the ruins of a pre-Inca culture not yet known to historians. We will create a short documentary film of the trek for YouTube with the intention of bringing global awareness to these ruins and thus help us to push for world heritage status and proper archaeological investigation. I feel this is a world issue, a matter of importance to all of humanity, Fenton says. And again, there's a link that if you were to want to donate to uh, him and his team, for further exploration that they do encourage you to do so. Which makes me um, makes me want to tell you about something. I had done recently some shows on the Thracians and I had talked about how only 20% of the of the mound structures and the um, archaeological sites in Bulgaria had even been explored. 
and that if I was a person of tremendous wealth and uh, fortitude and capacity, that I would certainly go there and I would absolutely dedicate my time to digging, excavating some of these sites and in the proper fashion. Um, but that my, I did hear back from my friend who is the one that leaked to me the text of the book of Atom and Ua, the Thracian text, which, you know, I had shared a portion of it here and which it talks about in Genesis chapter three, the verse that speaks about the certain serpent with, you know, in the King James version as being the most subtle of all creatures that it mentions the serpent or the Nakash uh, in the Hebrew as being the winged snake, the feathered serpent, the guardian of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But anyways, um, that my friend, I had asked him to come on to the show as well as Dr. Stephen Guy, the individual that translated the Thracian language and found that the hieroglyphic um, hieroglyphics and the you know the language of the Egyptians that it was based on the the script of the Thracians, and that the Thracian script predated that of the Egyptians. But anyways, um, sadly. I have to inform you that Dr. Stephen Guide has passed on. He's very young and was of really good health. And there's speculation that he was actually poisoned um, because his death was sudden. He had no health issues. And as I said, he was still very young. And so um, I'm not able to bring him on and have him give testimony as to how he translated the script, and we don't even know if, um, you know, if there's anybody that will be able to follow up on his work. But anyways, my friend Alexander is considering coming on and doing a show with us. English is not his first language, and he's not uh, predominantly skilled in you know, in being able to interview in that way, but I am encouraging him to do so. And so keep your fingers crossed and perhaps he will join us and then we can ask him more about the Thracian script and culture and the translation of the the text, the Book of Atom and Ua. Uh, no, Olive, I think you missed the show, brother. He asked me the book of Adam, Zen, am I talking about the apocalypse of Adam? The text that I'm referring to is called the book of Adam and Ua, and it is certainly similar to the, um, the book, the first book of Adam and Eve, which is part of the forgotten books of Eden, uh, the forbidden books of the Bible series. But no, there's this text, you can't find it on the internet. You can find a Latin version, the Vitae of Adam and Eve. Um, and, you know, as I said, the first book of Adam and Eve is similar, uh, but there are, you know, major differences. But that I believe this Thracian is the origin for those particular texts. And so. Um, Anyways, it, it predates the Thracian, you know, the, as a culture, they predate the Egyptians and the Sumerians by 2,000 years, 1,500 to 2,000 years. And that this particular text uh, is very old. And I did ask him about that. Uh, Dr. Stephen Guide is the one that, uh, that translated it and the origins for that translation uh, I'm not certain of, but he does provide it, portions of it, and, and and the translation in his four books. He did four books on the Thracian script decoded, 
and only the first two are bilingual, of which I have a copy of the second one, but you can't even find his books anymore. They're called Thracian Script Decoded, and they're written in Bulgarian. And as I said, the first two are bilingual, but the last two, um, my friend is actually going to translate those for me, the portions that are not available in the, the first two. And so, anyways. Okay, yeah, I know you do, uh, Olive. And uh, I'm glad that y'all are well studied and interested in that way. I think it's important to, uh, to study. Star Cruiser there's, has a question from the chat room and says, where are the archons in the Bible? The archons are the, the Nephilim as well as the fallen watchers. Um, the archons are the rebel angels and that the watchers later join them. It's all the same phenomenon. What Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 speaks of as we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, the rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places. It's that. Uh, they are who we are actually warring against. They're the eye at the top of the Illuminati period. I mean, at the pyramid. <laughs> uh all right, I need to get into these other two texts, and we're never going to make it through. And so let me, um, this next article that we're going to touch upon, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to skip through portions of it. Uh, but let me, let me go ahead and post the link to the, the article I just read first in the chat room. For those that, there's a lot of um, people that have just now joined us. And there's been a lot of you that have been with us for a while. And so, and this other article that I'm going to get into now is called The Amazing City of Giants Found Off the Georgia Coast. Which is interesting to me because I live here in Georgia. And I had already heard about how the Mayans had been here um, and that they had um, migrated up from South America to build structures here that are similar to those that are in South America. But you're welcome, Star Cruiser. Uh, SJ and Micah and all of you... Uh, Okay, and so, but I had not heard about there being red-haired cannibal giants living here in the state. Even though we still have mound structures, like there's one called the Etowa Mound, which is a, a state park south of where I live near Athens, Georgia. All right. We're going to... Go ahead and get into this article. Because the next article I want to cover will definitely take up the whole next segment. A gigantic walled city off the coast of Georgia has been found near Sapello Island. The city is thought to be older than the famous Egyptian pyramids of Giza. Ancient American Indian legends refer to the walled city where the giants with hair like red flames dwelled. Across the tribal lands of what is now the south and southwestern United States, the red-haired giants were known and feared. The legends claim the city was destroyed by pieces of the moon falling to the earth. It's this article which talks about the, you know, the, the giants having been devastated in such way. Um, and there's even a mention in Joshua, when Joshua is sent into the land of Canaan, that the Most High God uses, um, and I'll find that quote for you on the next break, but when Joshua asked the Most High to make the sun stand still so that they could kill off this tribe of giants, this 
the people that they were then warring against. Uh, the Most High killed more of them with, uh, um, you know, with asteroids or comets or whatever you want to call it, with stones from the heavens than Joshua and his band of Hebrew warriors did with their sword, which is interesting. All right. Archaeologists have made an amazing underwater find about six hours off the coast of Georgia, a legendary ancient walled city discussed by many Native American tribes over sputtering campfires for untold generations. The Sapello Shell Ring Complex, as it is called, is older than many of the structures of ancient Egypt. The city is at least 4,400 years old, and perhaps much older than that. It's my opinion that the pyramids of Giza are also very much older than that as well. The city was constructed on land before the seas rose to swallow it up, so it was likely built during one of the last smaller ice ages before the ice cap retreated, creating the stories of the Great Flood. That places the origin of the city and its heyday in the middle of the period when giants ruled parts of the earth from South and Central America to Southern and North, Southern North America, parts of Asia and pockets of Eastern and Western Europe. While most Homo sapiens at the time were barely five feet tall and many were in the four foot range, the giants were big even by modern day standards. The race of giants, according to Native American tales, recovered skeletons and ancient tools towered far above average humans. The men were as tall as 10 to 12 feet and many of the women reached 9 feet or taller. In that um, book that I made mention, Ancient Dragon, I mean Ancient Giants in the Americas, uh, there were discoveries of skeletons 30 feet tall here in America, some 24 feet tall, and some, uh, uh, you know, like many that were 18 and 12 foot between that range, and, you know, all sizes below that as well. And that there were also, on some of these larger skeletons, the, the skeletons, these skulls, they had protruding horns, like two spiked horns, four to six inches, uh, protruding from the frontal lobe. All right, I'm going to skip a little bit. The Sapello Shell Ring Complex challenges that belief of the architecture that remains of what was a, once a large city complex the dwellings layout, even stairs, were built to accommodate men twice as tall as most men are today. Three decades before the giants built their walled city, the European Bronze Age collapsed. The end of that age came after ongoing wars with roaming bands of ferocious leather-clad giants that dominated the land and treated puny humans as nuisances and sometimes cattle. Ancient myths claim that some of the giant clans were cannibalistic and enjoyed the taste of well-roasted long pig, which is human. Horrific tales still survive of the massive bonfires constructed by giants in preparation for their feast upon human flesh. Many historical documents describe the giants and some even tell of the walled cities where they live. The cities were places of evil and terror and to primitive humans that roamed the savage, unforgiving wilderness outside the safe harbor of the more technologically advanced giants and their walled fortress cities. Remember even in when Joshua goes into Canaan, one of the difficulties of taking over the cities that they encountered were, was that they were massively walled and that they were well protected. 
Among the most famous references to the giants that still survives today is the passage from the Old Testament, Genesis 6, chapter 4, or verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also after that. When the son of, sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. The ancient walled citadel off the Georgia coast is one of the cities of the giant mighty men of old, the men of renown. All right, I'm going to skip just a little bit more. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a final segment. I was talking about this um, recently discovered Shell City off of the coast of Georgia, here where I am, in the east coast United States of America. Um, I'm going to read the last part about the judgment, and then I'm going to try to get into this other article that I made mention. I'm going to pick up this follow-up next week with this same topic because I still have a lot of information that I'd like to share, and I'm not even going to be barely able to get through the the article that um, I want to cover in the next segment. And which we'll probably have to, you know, re-talk about it on the next show. And so, anyways, the, finish up the article on the Georgia city. Civilizations collapsed, cities and settlements destroyed, and the Bronze Age came to an abrupt end as much of the world's more advanced cultures fell briefly backwards into primitivism. Legends of the moon breaking and falling from the sky impact craters dated as about, at about 4,000 years old and the sudden loss of agriculture and technology across the world support the legends of the tribes that left the southern hemisphere migrating towards the north. What awaited them were the giants and their walled cities until pieces of the falling moon disrupted the carefully planned giant settlements and threw them into their own migration where they fought southwestern Indian tribes. The giants defeated by the elements and the meteoric, meteoric storms that destroyed their city fought the plains and the southwestern native tribes until they were finally totally defeated in their last stands against the Paiute Indians in what later became the state of Utah. And uh, in that show, I made mention of the show that I did on the red-haired cannibal giants, uh, of which you can find that on the, um, again, in my archives on YouTube under Endeavor Freedom. Um, while I'm doing that, I'm going to find that passage that I was talking about where Joshua went to war against these giant tribes and how the Most High used in the same way that it speaks about in this particular text how... Um, there was there was fire from the heavens, and that that was part of the judgment against these particular beings for being atrocious in the way that they were. And it was because they were cannibals. And they were also worshipped their fallen angel fathers and Lucifer and Satan in blood ritual. And that they offered sacrifice of their, um, of their children and also of victims. They 
did so in such way that um, the Most High brought judgment against them as they did their fathers during the deluge. That because they were involved in the same kind of, of abomination, um, you know, he would judge them as he did. Huh. Says that the link is not working, but. All right, let me see. Let me try this again. Uh, but anyways, and so just as in that particular where the deluge was to bring judgment against the fallen angels for what they had done, uh, the interdiction against the, you know, the children of humanity, that um, the same thing. During Joshua was, was sent into Canaan to be a judgment, uh, a sword judgment against these particular giants and these particular giant tribes. All right, let me find this passage. All right, uh, and then we'll continue on and I'll finish up with this. I should have found this during break, but I forgot it. I apologize. All right, let me read this. Um, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gideon, Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves Upon their enemies, is this not written in the book of Jasher? And so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Oh, uh, you know what? I think it was before this. Uh, but anyways, I'm not going to spend time, any more time looking for that passage. In this show that I do next week, I'll read it specific. But it does talk about in detail that uh, during the wars against these particular giant tribes that the Most High did rain down stones of terror or stones of fire from the heavens upon them and that more were killed in that capacity than they were with the sword of Joshua and his, his tribes. All right, the next article that I want to cover... And I had read something about this prior. I'm going to post a link to it in the chat room. It's a very long article. And it, the name of the article is An Alien Base Inside the Busigi Mountains. And this was released in from the Paca, Pac Alert Pakistani Press, um, where they you know, cover interesting news articles like one such as this. They also talk about the the giants and their connections to the pyramids in China. And uh, a lot of really interesting articles are released on in this particular Pakistani or Pakalar press, uh, the Pakistani um, news, one of their news services over there. And so let me post a link to that in the chat room. You'll definitely want to read this for yourself. And it's such a long article that you that I definitely won't be able to cover all of it or even a portion like a small portion of it. But I'm going to go directly to that part of it which is connected to the the giants but if you read the article in full there's a mention of how they discovered this particular alien base within this mountain and how like the bosnian pyramid it just looks like a a regular mountain but that you know it was so old that it was there before 
the city that came up and was built near and around it. Um, just like, you know, as I mentioned, the Bosnian city and that this kind of thing is being found and discovered all over the planet. And I had also made mention uh, in, the, in the, some shows that I did on this topic of the um, of the pyramids that were discovered in Antarctica and which have to be very, very old because they were built at a time before the ice, you know, covered them, much like the, the pyramids in China and other places that now have so much dirt and so, you know, trees and things of that nature uh, on, on top of them, growing on top of them that nobody knew or even uh, speculated that there were artificial structures underneath them because uh, uh, indeed they would have to be very, very old. But the part that I'm not going to read talks about how the U.S. military used ground-penetrating radar to discover this particular um, pyramid and that this pyramid it ties underground. There's an underground system that connects it to a pyramid of which they found that was similar in Iraq. And I had also talked about how the reason Iraq was targeted was because it, you know, has a lot of this ancient technology in some of these ancient cities, uh, a lot of cuneiform texts and, you know, um, and very ancient artifacts that are absolutely priceless. And that uh, and when we invaded, the, the United States invaded, um, organized groups immediately entered into the different museums housing a lot of these artifacts and empty them of all their possessions, of all of their valuables. And so that's one of the reasons we also targeted Afghanistan. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get into this. The Grand Gallery ended abruptly with a giant aula 30 meters in height and a length of 100 meters. The projection room was smaller than the lecture hall of the mountain and was protected by the energy shield. Advancing towards the energy shield, a portion of it disappears like a door, allowing access to the projection room. The shield protects the room by any outside influences. Once inside the room, the shield becomes compact and looks like white golden wall. In the back, the shield doesn't descend to the ground level like in the frontal area because at the back, it's a stone wall. The wall has 10 to 12 meters high and there were three enormous tunnel holes, one straight ahead, the other two symmetrical on both sides. They are lighted by a diffused light in a greenish tint. All right. From the front of the entrance hall contains a series of huge stone tables arranged along the right wall following its curvature. Similarly, there is another series along the left wall. None of the tables have a height less than two meters. On the tabletops were cut in relief with precision different signs of an unknown writing, characters that resembled ancient cuneiform. The writing also contains more general symbols such as triangles and circles. All those signs are not painted. They come out with a fluorescent light radiation in different colors from table to table. There are five tables on each side of the room. On some of them are different objects that appear to be technical tools. From many of them descending to the ground are a lot of white translucent wires which gather into rectangular boxes of shiny silver material. The boxes are placed directly onto the ground and the cables are extremely flexible and lightweight and light pulses can be seen circulating along their length. When approaching any of the tables, a holographic projection activates, showing aspects of a particular scientific field. The three-dimensional images are perfect and very large, with a height of almost two and a half meters. 
the projections run by themselves, but at the same time, they are interactive and depend on one who interacts with the tables by touching their, their surfaces. All right. They are covered with a film of dark glassy material. The film is divided into several large square bound by straight lines forming a kind of grid. At one table, the subject is biology and the projective image are of plants and animals, some completely unknown. Tapping one of the squares, the hologram shows the structure of the human body. It develops holographic images of various areas of the body that always rotate. Other squares show projections of other beings on other celestial bodies. By tapping simultaneously two different squares, a complex scientific analysis shows the DNA of both beings and possibilities of compatibility between them. On the side, vertical lines appear containing explanations, but in the strange writings seen everywhere, and at the end, the most probable mutant form appears after a result after combining the two genetic information. And so, just so you know, what I'm talking about is a, a table that when these giants used it, they were able to see how uh, creating a hybrid creature, mixing the DNA of these two particular beings, what results would possibly occur um, because we know that they were involved in the creation of hybrids and that the fallen angels had that a fo as a focus of their um, research because they were in the process of creating fit extensions for them to inhabit and to possess and in order to utilize when in this physical plane of existence. And I know this sounds all completely Star Trek-y and um, just far out, and uh, but or like that whole movie Prometheus, where the giants had come here and you know a long time ago. I mean, totally, totally far out. But this is the truth of the kind of stuff that. Um, we are dealing with as far as reality. And we have to realize also that the floods, the, the impacts, the devastation of not only the judgment uh, as cited in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, where it speaks about a time when there was not yet man, but the cities of the wilderness had been destroyed. Um, it, it, that, that judgment... Uh, and also the judgment against Atlantis, the flood of Noah's day, all of these judgments buried many of these complexes and megalithic sites, these ancient cities with very high technologies deep under the earth, and that many of them are lost completely to the memory, the consciousness and the collective memory of humanity. Um, but that that, you know, again, the fallen ones were here and that they had built structure, infrastructure, even deep underground. In the show I did last week, I spoke about how Phil Snyder talked about the creation of all these deep underground bases and how they were building on top of already existent structure. Same premise. All right, I want to read one more passage before we get to the end of the show. And we'll pick this up next week as well. Those who built the whole edifice were probably very tall. Otherwise, you cannot explain the huge size of all the objects in the projection room. A confirmation of the giants in Romania can be found in a newspaper called The Newspaper. Um, the team at The Newspaper is accompanied by researcher Vasil Rudan, who noted that the stories of people from the village Bazori about giants who lived on those lands have concrete evidence. A cemetery with skeletons of giants. It was discovered by chance over 20 years ago when it was decided in a village called Saini to plant apple trees. Digging on a hill, the villagers discovered huge skeletons measuring about 
2.4 meters, even more. Dragoi, one of those who worked in the apple orchard, then takes us to the spot by the height where trees were planted down to the steep slope on a street choked with mud. Once they arrive, Mr. Ely shows us around the orchard. Everywhere are the tombs of the giants. We were making holes to plant saplings when we found a human head as big as a pumpkin. Neither one of us had ever seen anything like that. We were all amazed. Sapping further and we found some bones of the feet as big as wine steaks. The dead one must have been very big. All right, I'm going to just stop here, and we're going to pick up this article uh, next week when I cover this this particular topic. And I'm also going to share some passages from the Bible in relation and other extra-biblical texts which make mention of the giants um, and, you know, and even like book, the book of Baruch, the second text, where it makes mention of 409,000 giants having been killed in the flood of Noah's day, that when you really read the Bible, the biblical text, there's mentions of giants all throughout them, all throughout the the entire scope of the the text. Uh, for instance, uh, well, you know, I'm not even going to be able to cover this, but there's passages, and when I, I'll read them next week when I have more time, because we're almost to the break. But uh, the whole, you know, a lot of people realize and remember the whole story of David and Goliath, how he was a shepherd boy, and he, he, uh, he fought against this Philistine giant for King Saul and that uh, after he stunned Goliath with a sling stone, he ran up to him and used his own sword to cut the head of Goliath off and then he took his head as trophy and went to, um, went to Jerusalem to show all the Hebrew people of his conquest and his slaughter of this Philistine giant that had been challenging every day Israel to uh, fight man to man, and that whoever would win would submit their armies to them. Um, God bless all. Thank you, Grog. Thanks, all of you, for taking the time to join us. I appreciate all of you, and uh, we'll do a follow-up next week. God bless and good night.